So it's a pleasure to be here to present uh, some highlights from the, uh, the thyroid project. I'm going to start with a very simple model of, uh, of thyroid cancer. Uh, let's see. So we start with the normal follicular cell and we progress to uh, well differentiated tumors, either papillary or follicular tumors, follicular adenoma and follicular carcinoma. Most tumors stop here, uh, but rarely they evolve into poorly differentiated or anaplastic carcinoma. And the point I want to make here is that there's a progressive loss of differentiation. Differentiation is very important for thyroid cancer, um, and it's actually the foundation of our classification. We talk about differentiated carcinoma and undifferentiated or anaplastic carcinoma with poorly differentiated in the middle. So it's a really a foundational thing uh, for, for thyroid cancer. Um, so when TCJ started this, uh, with 85% of the cases being papillary, it really became clear that, um, that we needed to focus on papillary. So our project is restricted to uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma. So, whoops. So um, there's three main types of papillary carcinoma. There is a uh, classical type um, that gets its name because it has these well-developed de papillary structures. There's, there's actually a, a follicular variant that is recapitulating normal thyroid architecture. And then there's a tall cell variant um, that has abundant cytoplasm and, and tall cells. And those are the three main types. There's other types, but we wouldn't get enough to really uh, power an analysis of the rare type, so we, we kept it uh, simple. And there's a very strong genotype-phenotype correlation um, uh, as shown here. So before the TCJ, this was sort of the, uh, the, the view of what genes were known to be mutated in papillary carcinoma, uh, mostly in BRAF and RAS, but also uh, rearrangements of RET and NTRK1. Uh, with infrequent PI3 kinase mutations. So that, that's sort of the foundation from which we started. So this is our cohort. We had uh, up to 496 uh, tumors uh, with 391 on all platforms, and we had 49 uh, whole genomes that we targeted at tumors that didn't have obvious driver mutations. So um, I really like this slide. It, it, I think it explains a lot. It shows that amongst all these tumor types, that thyroid carcinoma, papillary thyroid carcinoma, has a re relatively low mutation density, uh, and actually the lowest if you restrict your view of this to solid tumors like especially carcinomas. So it's, uh, you know, the, the next one that starts in is prostate here and breast. So, uh, and we think this is uh, partly the reason why it's such an ind indolent carcinoma. Whoops. A little jumpy. So this is our um, overview of our somatic uh, alterations, and I'll go through just a point, a few points here. So we have mutation rate and clinical information, and significantly mutated uh, genes. The first thing to notice is there's not much up there, right? There's a lot of a lot of white spaces here, um, so it's a relatively quiet genome. We can see that BRAF alterations are common in about 60 percent of cases, and then we have uh, mutually exclusive RAS mutations. We have a new uh, G mutation here, EIF1AX, which I'll talk a little bit uh, more about, uh, which is mutually exclusive with RAF and BRAF. Um, and then we also discovered PPM1D and, uh, and CHECK2 as significantly mutated. Um, and then we jump to the fusions, and you can see we have a diverse collection of fus fusions that make up about 15 percent of the cohort, some expected, RET, um, but also diverse fusions of BRAF. So that's one of our interesting findings, that we have these BRAF uh, fusions. Uh, and you can see that these are mutually exclusive with each other and also with the uh, point mutations. So that's a very nice story. And then we jump down to the copy number changes. And again, many, many of the BRAF mutated tumors don't have uh, a lot going on in terms of copy number change. And then you can see very uh, interestingly, we have a concentration of uh, arm level copy number changes uh, that start up when the, the point mutations and the fusions go away. So we're speculating that there are drivers embedded in here. We obviously can't pinpoint the genes, but um, we, we think this is an interesting result and very provocative. And so if you allow us to count those as, uh, as potential drivers, we end up with only about uh, 14 cases that without a driving event 
out of 400. And this is relevant because, you know, in using the ex existing genes, if you genotyped 100 cancers, you'd only find a driver in about 75 percent. So we've expanded the universe of, of driving uh, events, and that will have profound influences on molecular diagnostics. So this is EIF1AX, and here's our mutations. Um, and they're sort of landing in the same region as those reported in the Cosmic Database and in this paper here on uveal melanoma. So we, ha we haven't functionally proven this. Jim Fagan's actually working on this uh, at Memorial, but we haven't proven this is a driver, but we think it will turn out to be uh, a real event. So here's our fusions. We have some new RET partners. We have, um, uh, and we think they're real because they retain the kinase domain and express the kinase domain. We have diverse BRAF fusions. We've discovered, uh, and a few other people have discovered, that ALK, is, ALK fusions are present in about 1 percent of the cohort, and then ETV6, uh, uh, NTRK3, which also came up in a screen of uh, radiation-induced papillary carcinomas recently. So we think this is a, a, bit, a big part of our story, these new fusions. Oops, it's a little jumpy. So if you look now at the 14 cases that are officially dark, they're actually not that dark. We, we do have some interesting mutations, ATM, APC. We have some hits on uh, some potential fusions. So, you know, if you allow us to count maybe some of these as potential drivers, we're really down to about five cases that don't have any explained uh, cancer mutation. So there was a report that suggested BRAF was subclonal. So we specifically looked at the, the five drivers. And, and using absolute to, to make a statement about their clonality. And we're making a strong statement in the paper that, you know, these drivers are, in fact, clonal, which has implications for targeted therapy. So, so what were some of the challenges that we faced when we did this project? One, um, it's restricted to papillary carcinoma, which is a very indolent, well-differentiated tumor uh, that's cured 95 percent of patients. Um, and if you're going to study the outcome of this disease, you really need 20-year data, and our cases don't have anything close to that. So that was a challenge. And then we have this relatively low muta mutation density. So that presented us with really with two choices. We could sort of write up a biomarker paper that you know, had some new point mutations, talk about the fusions, do the clustering, and, and call it a day, um, or we could push. And um, Gaddy and I maybe synergized, and we pushed. Uh, so we focused on the fact that these drivers were mutually exclusive, that we had a relatively quiet background genome in which we could explore the role of these drivers. Uh, we had all this multidimensional data, and we had a very, you know, great and imaginative AWG. So the first thing we did is we said, well, let's explore this difference between BRAF and RAS. And um, we developed a, a, a signature, a 71 gene expression signature that separated these tumors out, and then we converted that into a, a score, a BRAF V600E RAS score that we call BRS. And uh, we scaled that from minus one to one and then displayed the tumors. And what you can see here is that displays the tumors along this gradient. And it's not black and white. There's a, there's a transition that goes on here in the middle, um, and then we can use this score to, in, to explore how the other mutations, you know, where they fall on this, on this gradient. And what's really fascinating, you can see that there's some BRAF mutations that are not V600E that are actually RAS-like. Uh, and this one's actually the BRAF K601E mutation, and that's consistent with the literature because those are uh, thought to be, you know, the follicular variant which tend to be more RAS-like tumors. And then you can see some of the other fusions, like the Pax A P par gamma, are weakly RAS-like, and that makes sense. So this was a, a, a nice way to explore uh, how these other mutations uh, might signal. And then if you bring in all the other data into this figure, uh, you can really see that the biology of these RAS-like tumors is very different across all platforms from the BRAF-like tumors. And that's one of our overarching conclusions, that these are fundamentally very different uh, tumors. Then we turn to, to thyroid differentiation. And th this was known that when you pick up a BRAF mutation, that you, you have a loss of differentiation, and particularly silencing of the iodine metabolism machinery. And so we wanted to explore this in our cohort. And so, uh, oops. So um, this is a complicated slide, but basically um, these genes are those responsible for the iodine metabolism machinery, and we displayed them uh, uh, in context with genotype. Here's BRAF V600E, here's RAS, here are the fusions, and you can immediately see that tumors on this side, which are the 
The follicular variant tumors are more differentiated than the BRAF tumors. That's, that's not a shock. But what's really interesting um, uh, is within the BRAF V600E cohort, we see a range of differentiation. And you say, well, why is that, why do we care? We care because there's probably at least 100 papers that have looked at BRAF as a biomarker in isolation. In other words, the field is treating BRAF V600E papillary carcinoma as a homogeneous tumor group. And our data suggests that that's maybe not appropriate. So then we got interested in, well, what are the drivers of that? What are the potential drivers? What's correlated to that? And we found out some, uh, some interesting genes like trefoil factor three and two oncomeres, MIR-21 and 146, and a, a potential tumor suppressor, MIR, were correlated to the TDS score that we derived um, fr from these genes. Uh, and, and so we have some interesting possibilities, and keep those in mind because they'll resurface later. So we used um, different kinds of data. We used the messenger RNA and the RPPA data. The group at Memorial spent a lot of time in figuring out the signaling consequences of these two drivers. Uh, the take-home point is that um, the BRAF-like tumors s signal pretty much exclusively through MAP kinase and that the RAS uh, tumors are, have a much more complicated, a uh, little bit more PI3 kinase, but also some, some, um, some MAP kinase. So we, we explore this and really show that there's fundamental differences here. And then onto the clustering. Um, we, I don't really have time to go through each platform, so I'll show the super cluster. Uh, basically, all the cluster, all platforms, like I showed in the earlier figure, show that there's a striking difference between the RAS-driven tumors and the BRAF V600-like driven tumors. Um, and there's histologic differences, et cetera. So that's not shocking. Again, it confirms our big uh, conclusion. What's interesting, though, is that there's a cluster here that is very robust and it matches up between the different platforms, methylation, messenger RNA, microRNA, and that it's maybe hard to see, but these are enriched for the tall cell tumors. So we think that, that there's a distinct cluster of tall cell tumors that have distinct expression profiling. Um, and so that becomes uh, more important in the context of this, where we, we really focused on the mirrors as part of the story. And I'll spend a little time going through this. So basically, mirror cluster one, are, are RAS-like tumors, um, and then we have five classes of the BRAF-like tumors. And you can start to see that there's some interesting molecules that are preferentially expressed in some of these MIR classes. And I'll focus on this one, MIR-21, a known oncomere is here. And, and why do we think that's relevant? Well, we actually uh, took the scores that we developed in the middle part of the paper, the BRAF-RAS score and the thyroid differentiation score, and, and use them throughout this, the clustering section to make it more rich and informative. And you can see here, uh, this cluster has three of, three of the, three-fourths of the tall cell tumors. It's in a BRAF background. There's not a lot of other mutations going on. It has uh, a higher risk. It has, uh, I graded all the tumors and, and it has a higher grade. Um, it has clearly different messenger RNA profiles. Um, and, but mo most importantly, it's the most BRAF-like, because it has the lowest BRAF RAS scores, and it's the least differentiated. It has the lowest thyroid differentiation scores. And so, so why do we care about this? You know, because I admitted that, we, that the tall cell is, um, you know, a recognized variant. Well, we care about it because, as come through in all pathology talks, we tend to disagree. And so what I call a tall cell, another person may not call a tall cell. So if we can actually uncover a molecular marker of the tall cell, that would be adapted widely by the thyroid community. So we're very excited about this. And then there's a similar story here for cluster five and MIR-146, which I remind you were the MIRs that we uncovered uh, back in when we were looking for correlates of the TDS. So we think uh, the different parts of the paper fit together nicely and support each other. And we really worked hard to tell this integrated uh, uh, clustering story. So uh, our overarching conclusions um, were that RAS-driven PTCs and, and BRAF V600 uh, PTCs are basically fundamentally different. And so it begs the question, should we 
reclassify thyroid cancer to, to sort of separate them. And, and there's some data that suggests we should. There was a paper in the New England Journal from Jim Fagan's group where they're looking at a MEK inhibitor that had differential responses um, for, for recovering res uh, susceptibility to ra radioactive iodine, and it depended on what your underlying genotype was. So I think the days where you could lump papillary carcinoma and run a, cl a clinical trial without knowing what the underlying drivers are and what the, uh, what the phenotype is, is just it's coming to a, an end. Likewise, we identified clinically relevant subgroups of, of BRAF-driven PTCs, and we have a potential role for MIR. So we think um, things are going to come from that. So we're, we're actually very excited about the, how this whole project uh, played out. I know somebody sent me an email like, well, Tom, you know, a year ago, this was kind of looking kind of maybe not dull, but, you know, uh, and now it's really turned into this kind of interesting story. So we're very excited about this, and if you don't believe me, then here we are. Um, I, I like Gordon especially. Um, so we do think this will be a landmark study uh, for the thyroid field. And so far, it's already having impact. As I mentioned, Jim Fagan's working on the biology of EIF1AX, um, in part catalyzed by this. Uh, Yuri Nikiforov is starting a working group of pathologists to explore the follicular variant and can we come up with the proper way to diagnose this. There's a lot of argument and disagreement amongst pathologists, so he's actually looking for support from the NCI to study this. And then we had a collaboration, um, Hopkins, Mayo, Michigan, and Cornell looking at BRAF in isolation like many other people, and then when this, the mirrors came out, I convinced the group to say, well, let's, let's expand this study. So now we have hundreds of cases. And the whole goal is can we use these uh, mirrors in combination with or without BRAF to predict central compartment lymph node di uh, positivity and, and sort of guide surgery. So I do think our paper will be very impactful. Uh, of course, there's many, many people to thank, but I do need to give a, a special thanks to, uh, to Chip, who was the analysis coordinator and really uh, cranked through massive amounts of analyses. And of course, Gaddy uh, was amazing to work with. So uh, I want to just take a moment to thank uh, TCJ leadership for giving me the opportunity to work on this project. What's nice about this is that uh, Gary Hammer, who's here from Michigan, and I uh, you know, convinced Kenna to start a project on adrenal cancer. So we used the opportunity of being involved in thyroid to span um, adrenal cortical project and then the field project, which I'll also play a role. So this has really been a very exciting time and a fun time for me. And I would just like to thank everyone and acknowledge the AWG. I'll be glad to take some questions. Hopefully I did it in time. Tom, very nice talk. So the question I have is for those genomically very silent ones, where do they fall? Do they fall to the rest like or do they fall to the BRAF? Um, the, the, the remaining dark matter tumors? Yeah. They, they're the, they tend to be, they're enriched in the follicular variant. And so the truth is, those are the cases that pathologists argue about, right? Because uh, yeah. there's, it's yeah. it's really complicated, but yeah, it's yeah. not. So basically, those are different diseases, basically, right? Um, so like different. It, it happens to many kind of the kidney that we see that it could be. You know, it could yeah. be. I mean, so it, we can talk afterwards. I, you know, it's a long, a long answer. Bring, yeah, Matthew. Hey, Tom. So I was I, a lot of a lot of in, incredible stuff in there, but I was really struck by the um, mutations in the thyroglobulin gene. Right, and I was curious if those are loss of function mutations. Yeah, so we, we put them in the paper, Matthew, but we're, we're not exactly sure, you know, how meaningful they are. They're in there. We, we went back and forth on that. Uh, maybe Chip's here. Uh, not sure. We're not, that's why we, did, we put it in there, but we didn't make a big deal about it. No. Um, the guys at MD Anderson, Steve Sherman, was very excited about that, but the story didn't pan out as, as uh, strongly as we thought. So. Not sure how meaningful they are. So it's just a striking feature of different cancer types that I don't understand. But you have loss of function mutations of albumin in uh, hepatocellular so, right. carcinoma. There's loss of function mutations of uh, collagen in chondrosarcoma. And this might be part of that same pattern. It might be. I mean, Mutig did not pick up on them uh, because it's, it is a very large gene. So, I mean, I think there's still more work to do on those, on those individual uh, mutations. So what Matthew was saying is that we look specifically at thyroid receptors and thyroid globulin, and um, it's sort of a controversial point. There are a lot of mouse models on, on receptors, but we that didn't pan out in our data set. We had a low incidence, maybe a couple of percent of thyroid globulin mutations. We're not really sure how significant they are. 
They had not picked up on Mutig. You know, so, you know, Mutig has different versions. I think some of the earlier versions picked up uh, thyroglobulin, but not the later ones. Okay, great, thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. That was a wonderful uh, story. Um, so now the next uh, presentation will be by Ali Amin Mansour on somatic alterations and clinically relevant cancer genes among 12 TCGA tumor types. Ali.